All right, let's begin this morning in the Old Testament in the very first book of the Bible, in Genesis chapter 2, this will be verse 23 and 24. Jeff is pretty much our starter this morning, and so he's going to read these two verses, and we're going to talk a little bit about it, and then we're going to move into some not controversial things, but things sometimes that chap people a little bit when they don't really understand the principle. Okay, Jeff. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. Okay, as we talk about family, and we begin here talking about the creation, and most of us understand the creation from the standpoint of what the Bible teaches here. Bone of my bones, we know what that means. Flesh of my flesh, she shall be called woman. But I want you to to, to think about the thought here. And this always gets people into trouble sometimes when they think about it. Because I'm going to carry you to another verse of Scripture in just a minute that sort of puts something into a perspective here. He says, She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Now, a lot of times people, they get real upset when you start talking about the role of subjection and what the Bible teaches about it. But... From the standpoint of uh, the Bible, we have to understand how important this particular part of of it is. She shall be called woman because she was taken from man. Now, if a man shall leave his, therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. We understand that principle. But when you really and truly think about something else that goes along with this, uh, I think sometimes people forget uh, how important that particular verse that we just read was. Uh, Why would it be that the Bible would indicate that she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man? Say, woman gives birth to the child. You know, she gives birth to the child. So the man doesn't, but nevertheless, we'll see a verse of Scripture in just a moment here that's going to give us a little insight on this. Now, in Genesis 18 and verse 19, we're going to stay there for just a minute. We're talking about the family unit, and then we'll go back to the woman and the man in just a minute. But in Genesis 18, verse 19, we're going to look at something else here. I think personally what's wrong with our whole society is the fact that people have not looked at what the Bible teaches about family and family units. No family, I don't guess, is perfect. Now, it's all, no, no, not mine, not yours, not anybody's, but from the standpoint of how the family unit should work and how it should go, there's all kind of rules and understanding of what God gave us to put the family unit to where it needs to be, where it can be, and I will say this, and, and I always get in trouble, a functional family, Okay. Now, we all know what a dysfunctional family is, don't we? And a functional family, that's what we're going to concentrate on. So let's look at Genesis 18 and 19. Let's go to our right-hand side. Sandy, I'm going to call on you first. Genesis 18 and 19. Okay, uh, let's give some, some consideration here to the thought of what he said. I know that he will command his children and his household after him. What really and truly can we say about those last two words, after him? What can y'all, can you think of something that that really and truly puts an emphasis on? What, okay, what kind of an example are we? And and I I want you to understand that principle. You know, if he commands his children after him, that means it's put the position of that one into an example position. Okay? Are you real happy if your children follow your rule 
Are you real happy with your children if they follow your example? Now, there may be, there may be a difference there between the two. And I, like I say, it always gets me into trouble. But I've seen a lot of people that says, don't do as I do, but do as I say do. Now, what is wrong with that, that principle? It's not in the Bible. It's not in the Bible. In fact, what's in the Bible is exactly what we just read or what was just read to us. Sandy read it there. It says he's going to command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment. So let's put the example and the after him together. You know, I mean, how could we expect our children to do something right if we do something wrong? Somebody says, well, we're the parent. I've had people tell me that. We're the parent. I'm the parent. They're supposed to do what I say. Let me tell you something. This is based upon personal experience. I believe with all my heart you can do a better job being an example than you can being a commander. Y'all want to shake your head right or wrong? I, I think that's the truth. And, you know, uh, people talk to me all the time about parenting, you know, young people, older people, grandfathers, grandmothers. Most, I don't know what the percentage is now, but it was about 33 or 34 percent of the nation of children were being raised by the grandparents. You know, that's a lot. So let's talk about the principle of how the family ought to work. And, and this is where we start getting into trouble. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 3. Now let's look at the New Testament for just a minute. 1 Corinthians 11 and verse number 3. Terry, I'm going to call on you on that one. But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ and the head of the woman is a man and the head of Christ is God. Okay. Now, <clears throat> let's, let's stop right there for just a minute. The head of the woman is the man. <clears throat> now I want to give you why. I want, to, I want to give you the answer for that so that you'll understand that. Now, verse 7 and 8 of that same chapter, <clears throat> verse 7 and 8 of that same chapter. Ain't Burley, you want to read verse 7 and 8 of 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 7 and 8. Now, y'all listen to this. I'm giving you the answer to the head of the woman is the man. Okay, now, did you notice verse 8? He says, for the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. Now, remember where we started today? We started over here in the very beginning, and we, we looked at a passage of Scripture that says, you know, she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Then we read this verse that says, for the man, he's not of the woman, but the woman is of the man. We see why, we see how. But we put the head of the woman... As the man. Now, I didn't do that. God did. Now, a lot of people get offended and say, well, you know, it's, it's, an, it's an equal partnership. It is an equal partnership. But at the same time, you have to understand this is the institution of the family unit. This is how it works. This is where you set it up. The man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. Neither was a man created for the woman, but the woman was created for the man. Now, why was the woman created for the man? Let's get this out so that we can understand this principle. We're talking about, in a few minutes, we're going to be talking about children and parents. But right now, why was the woman ever created for the man? Huh? To be a helpmate. But there's something else about this. This is very important. The man by himself... He can't reproduce. The man, the man Allen, we can't make a baby together. We hope not. <laughs> but here's the deal. It's understandable when you see how God set this up. Now, we're living in a society today where this, this is taboo. I mean, you can't talk this way. I mean, I've had people get on to me and say, you know, that's not a good subject to deal with. But let me tell you, the woman is the glory of the man, 
And the reason she's the glory of the man is because she's giving that man the opportunity to reproduce. His genetics can go on. Without the woman, he can't do that. Now, he's the head of the woman because God put him there. Now, Christ is the head of the man. You know why? Because God put him there. Christ is the head of the man, and the man's the head of the woman. Now, does that mean, I mean, how you know, people say, well, you know, you can become overbearing. Anybody can be overbearing, but we're talking about the emphasis of how the family unit is created. Now, after we learn this, you know, there, there's a lot of things in the, in the Bible that a lot of people don't even like to think about. But let's look at Colossians 3 and verse 18. God put the woman and the man together. He gave them the ability through the seed of the man and the seed of the woman to reproduce and bring forth the child, you know. And that's a wonderful, that, that's a miracle of God. But let's look at something else about this. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 18, let's see. Sandy read last, so I'm back on the left-hand side. Steve, would you read that? Wives, submit to your own husbands. Now, people have a tendency sometimes to think of this, maybe in a sexual manner. But this is not altogether in a sexual manner. We're talking about the submission, okay? It can very easily include that aspect, the physical aspect of marriage. It can include that, but also, this is something else. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands because it's fit in the Lord. Submission is not just in one category. There's other ways to submit, right? I mean, a family unit has to have submission in lots of ways, more than just one way. So it's a great thing, and it's an honorable thing, to think about what God did when he said, wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands. Notice that your own husbands... We're living in a society sometimes where, you know, we get this out of kilter. We talk about adult situations, adult things that happen, and submission that, that goes into a, one of those categories that people don't like to talk about. But let me tell you something. If a preacher's going to do his job, he needs to be talking about those things too. He needs to be putting this role of submission where it belongs. It's not just in a physical capacity. It's also in a spiritual capacity. It's also in a format of how it should work. When husbands love your wives, even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. When a husband loves his wife in the way that Christ loved the church, how did he love the church? He gave himself for it. If a husband loves his wife to that extent where he'd give himself for it, there won't be no problem with submission. We're not talking about from just the physical aspect. Anybody got a thought or a comment? And that's, that's one of the most important aspects of this. You know, it, it goes both ways. But from the standpoint of how God set this up, you know, and people don't, like I say, this gets people into trouble every time when you start studying about it. I did this up in uh, uh, Georgia in a gospel meeting, and man, I'm telling you, it created havoc, you know. And, and some women come to me, and they give me down the river about what I said about how this works. But now let me tell you something. It works exactly the way God said it, and it has to work that way, you know. And they say, well, you know, what if you got a sorry husband? Then you got a sorry husband. You know, I understand that principle. But it still doesn't take away from the way God set this up. We're talking about faithful understanding of what God said. Now, let's look at something else here. Um, if we're looking at, this, this goes to what Jeff said here. Let's look at 1 uh, first, uh, first Timothy, 1 first Timothy chapter 3. Let's go over to 1 Timothy chapter 3. Now, we're getting into some, some qualifications here, but we're looking at the principle of how the family unit should work. Let's look at verse number 4 and verse number 5. And this carries us a little further into that business of wives submit yourselves to your own husbands, for this is fit or right in the Lord. A husband that's going to fit that category is going to be right here in 4 and 5, in verse 4 and 5. David? One that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all 
of gravity, for if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Okay. Now, there's a lot of things that goes along hand in hand with just these two verses. When he talks about it, he says he has to be blameless. He has to be the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach. All those things go into that. But I wanted to concentrate on these last two things. One that ruleth well his own house. He says, having his children in subjection with all gravity. The only way it's ever going to work is whenever time to worship comes. Guess what? With children. You're going to have them in worship. I'm telling y'all from a standpoint that I know I've been here a long time and I've been in the pulpit a long time. Functional families that make it with what the Bible teaches here is the ones most of the time that have their children in worship, that have their children somewhere to learn about God, somewhere to learn about what God intends for them, and by the way, it's mamas and daddies. You remember we started off with example. You know, do as I do. You know, this is important. So, you know, all this has to do with, with how the family unit becomes successful. You know, I hear all these divorce uh, statistics. You know, when young people get married, one out of two before the age of before 21, age 21, the ends in divorce before the first 12 months passes. <clears throat> I don't know, but I know this. You can keep a marriage together, and you can keep one functioning properly if you do what God said do. This will work. It'll work. Now, don't mean that you're not going to have a few uh, step-downs. You may have a few arguments. There may be a time... You know, it, uh, you know, things just don't hardly go just exactly the way it ought to. But still, this is where it's at. It's in the Bible. This is how it works. One that ruleth well with his, with his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. What do y'all suppose that means, children in subjection? Just like the wife in subjection. And the husband's in subjection. But on the other hand, and he's right, but here's where you start. You got Christ here at the top. Next feller down is the man, okay? If he can't be in subjection to Christ, she can't be in subjection to him. You know, and it, it goes that way. And people, you know, if you've got, if you've got somebody, a rebellious man, that don't, he, he don't go to church, you know what? I guess this is where I always get in trouble. The you know, biggest percentage of people that bring their children to church, is it daddies? No. Is it mamas? Yes. Yeah. Is it grandmamas? Yes. You see, all my life, I see it, you know, and what it ought to be is dad walks in, mama behind him, and then the little children right on there with them, you see. But, you know, when I start talking about this, people say, well, you know, you, you may have had, oh, I didn't. I'm just like everybody else, you know. When you have family units that are in subjection in the role that the Bible teaches, things get a whole lot better, and it works. Okay, if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care, he said, of the church of God? And we know this to be the importance of that. Now, here's something I want us to talk about in Deuteronomy. My time's almost up, but Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 19. I want to go back to the Old Testament for just a minute here. And then we'll put a little humor into this. But let's look at Deuteronomy 11, verse 19, and we'll read verse 20. Let's see, I'm back to my right-hand side. Okay, Pam Johnson, you want to get that for me? When you shall keep hearing your children, speaking unto them from you, thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by thy way, when thou liest down, and when thou risest up, for thou shalt write them upon the doorposts of thine house and upon thy gates. Okay. I don't know how many hours in a week. That's a bunch. But you know what most kids get? They get just 30 or 40 minutes, maybe 45 minutes or an hour. Even if they are in worship, that's all they get. Now, if we're really going to do it the way the Bible teaches, he said, teach your children speaking to them when they sit 
when they sit us down in thine own house, when they walk by the way, when they lie down, when they rise up, write them on the doorpost of the house. Now, that don't mean one hour a week, does it? I mean, that means, and, and you know, we're living, in a, we're living in a time where they, they disallowed anything to do with God outside the home right now. You can't do it at school. You can't do it at school. I have some thoughts on that, and that's the evil, and I have to repent of that. But you can't do it at school. You can't do it in the workplace. You can't do it nowhere else. Well, let me tell you something. You can do it at home. You can do it at home. And you can do it in the church. And you know, if you really put God first and you, and you fo follow the teachings of what the family unit ought to be, there are going to be some teaching at home. They need to be prayers at home. They need to be Bible reading at home. They need to be studying at home on the Bible. You know, it, it can't just be that 30 or 40 minutes in the back or here in front, you know, and what little bit they get there. It has to be all the way you know, where it can be. Now, uh, let's think about a couple of things here. We'll put a little, uh, Joshua 24 and 15, somebody ought to know that by heart. We, I, I taught that to you a long time ago. Uh, anybody want to recite that for me? <laughs> 